नमस्ते नमस्कार आई थैंक लेट मी थैंक द Rajdhani Temple trustees and uh, the people who are actually here doing the work in the temple, Pandit Ji, and all friends who are here on a Saturday morning. Uh, I must also, uh, I'm very thankful to Smita Ji for her little performance. short but sweet and nice and since janmashtami is around the corner it was indeed a wonderful thing that you did hmm? and the composition which you did was really one of the important compositions yeah um <clears throat> so today since we are in the temple premises i won't talk about vedanta Usually, people ask me to talk about Vedanta, or the Atman, about the Supreme, and so on and so forth. But we are in a temple today, and a temple is not just a place of worship. Like a temple is a place where knowledge is also distributed. Arts are practiced. We saw a dance. There's music, and here I am sitting here and talking. So, it's a meeting place not it's not only a place where you install the deity and worship it's also a place where uh, people gather together and share their thoughts and experiences especially on how to evolve how to grow how to move forward um but it's quite normal that when people come to a temple usually they ask for like promotions and want to have a child and not married yet and so on it's quite common because human beings have their own uh limitations and conditions so can't say anything about that however since tomorrow is janmashtami tomorrow yes tomorrow is janmashtami i'm going to talk today more on krishna and uh, the path of devotion rather than like yesterday we had a talk at leisure world continuing knowledge what was that lifelong knowledge lifelong learning yeah so today we will talk uh, discuss about lifelong devotion <laughs> mm. is interesting because while krishna is depicted as dancing in vrindavan with the gopis and going to war with kamsa and helping arjuna to find the battle of kurukshetra and so on it's one place he assumes the role of a guru which is in the bhagavad gita there he becomes jagat guru i mean a real jagat guru not a human being so in that in that role he teaches arjuna and the basic principle is that there are different approaches to the truth gita is an entire like a like a uh, swaras of music it has all chapters dealing with different ways of approaching the spirit starting with arjuna vishad yoga which i think is the level in which most people are uh, gita the chapter on arjuna's confusion uh, insecurity sorrow and so on from there gently he leads arjuna up to knowledge to sankhya to karma so each chapter vyasa notes at the end of each chapter that it's a yoga then in the 12th you come to bhakti devotion and then you go on and on uh oh, very many people wonder why is krishna talking about bhakti only in the 12th chapter why can't he do it in the beginning 
it would have been easier why should we go through this whole if you look carefully you will notice that if krishna had probably talked about devotion in the first chapter arjuna would have said hey this is boring let's do something else or teach me how to get out of sorrow first i am in trouble so he leads him gently so why wait till the 12th chapter because up to you will notice up to the 9th chapter arjuna and krishna seem to be on equal terms talking to each other like friends somebody is riding the chariot someone is controlling the reins and they are good friends and they are also relatives in a way on equal terms krishna says something arjuna asks questions and then in the ninth chapter krishna changes his note and starts talking something which arjuna cannot understand he suddenly says among the muni i am kapila among the immovables achala i am the himachala among the uh, mountains i am meru among the vedas i am samaveda so for a second arjuna is completely confused taken aback this was a guy who was sitting and talking to me all this time i was asking questions sometimes he said do this and i said i can't do it can you help me out and so on and suddenly he says i am the meru and i am the himachala and i am samaveda what is this happening here which means what it's in the ninth chapter sorry in the 10th chapter that arjuna's so called sure shot rational mind is being broken so still then everything was 1 plus 1 is equal to 2 here things are changing and arjuna is beginning to, what is this guy saying he was sitting with me till now so what's happening is very slowly the the little we call this what we all say oh i have a very rational mind you know i have my own rational framework which is good i understand but that infinite which represents krishna here cannot be found with that finite little mind and that what we call rational is very limited i won't, i won't go into it and i promise but i couldn't help saying a few things so what happened here is that he is breaking down his theory about things you know if you need to look at that which is beyond the senses beyond the panchendriyas one needs to understand that all our knowledge is limited now here is breaking out into saying things which shakes up arjuna's so called logical mind and he begins to wonder what he is saying now starting then in the 11th chapter there is something called vishwarupa darshana which shocks arjuna out of his wits he sees there is this man who was sitting in front of him this devaki's little boy has suddenly transformed into something a tremendous energy like a black hole going in and out and then his so called judgment and reasoning which is dependent on the five senses is broken he says i cannot understand i think i cannot understand i can't touch that my finite mind is weak it can't approach that is the beginning of bhakti so immediately after he shatters arjuna's sure sure surety and certainty then begins the 12th chapter called bhakti yoga is interesting because people say if the supreme being is uh, all pervading brahman and if it's also in our hearts as a spark why do we worship usual question the reason is given in the 12th chapter when krishna tells arjuna that while you can conceive of the supreme being as the formless almighty and so on human minds are very attached to name and form and therefore 
it's easier to link with the supreme being while depending on name and form and if it is the supreme being then it must be everywhere so why not in a temple you can say why not outside okay fine that's that's exactly what it is okay if you want to do that but it's also here in the name and form and human beings are naturally inclined to name and form we all like our name and form at least our own form don't we morning before coming here how many of you look didn't look at the mirror and see how the hair style is so we are attached to nama and rupa and therefore it's not so easy you can philosophically speculate but it's not so easy to fix your attention so if you have something which you can actually do with your hands alankara ringing of the bells showing of the lights beautifully decorated then what happens the mind which is naturally attuned to name and form attaches itself to it then that seva leads one to the higher levels of devotion right having said this i want to tell you a little story there was a uh, another uh, we have a long nose sindur falls um there was another m who lived many years ago in calcutta he wrote a book called the gospel of ram krishna and he was a headmaster in a school so he could visit ram krishna only on sundays but in the beginning he didn't want to see this man at all so once apparently he had a problem which we all married people know i am a married man myself he fought with his wife and then he decided and some of his friends told him if you want a little bit of peace of mind go to the garden of dakshineshwar of rani rasmani it's a beautiful place it's on the banks of the hogli river which the bengalis call the ganga and uh, if you are lucky you might meet a paramahamsa there so even otherwise it's okay so he set out on a horse a uh, cart horse buggy half way through he thought i am not going to dakshini so he didn't like that paramahamsa business so he said he was from the brahmo samaj those days all the youth of bengal were part of the brahmo samaj so he thought i'll go somewhere else but what happened was when the horse cart reached the front of the dakshinishwar gardens the axle broke so he had to get down so he got down he saw the garden he said okay let's go in there so he went in there and uh, he was appreciating the garden he could see the river from there and then his a gentleman came towards him wearing a red bordered bengali dhoti in uh, bengali style you know how it is the pallav becomes so long you have to fold it and put it in your pocket <laughs> and you must have seen the sri ramakrishna's picture mostly with beard but in those days he was clean shaped and very fair and shining face and he had just eaten some pan so the lips were red and he was wearing polished leather jutis this gentleman came to him and asked him um so when he came near m asked him uh do you know any paramahamsa living here so he smiled and said i mean jani na i'm sorry he said i don't know but um, sit down let's have a chat <laughs> he sat down and then he asked him uh, you are a young educated bengal that's how they used to refer do you believe in god with form or without form 
So, Mahendranath Gupta M said, uh, my God is the formless supreme reality, Brahma Samaj. So he said, okay. So this formless supreme God of yours, does he live in some heaven somewhere or is he everywhere? All pervading. He said he's everywhere, he's all pervading. Okay. Then he showed him the temple of Kali there. He said, so there's the image of the mother there. He, yeah, he could see it. So if your God is all pervading, he must also be inside that, right? Can you take it off from there? You can't. So I worship God this way, as a mother. M was stunned because he was a professor and nobody had talked to him in those, on these terms. So then what happened? Not the end of the story. Uh, he left saying that I won't come back here. What should I do with this man? He left. Then on a Sunday, Sri Ramakrishna was sitting and having cracking jokes and laughing with the boys who surrounded him. One of the boys became Swami Vivekananda, somebody became Brahmananda and so on. Those days there were young boys sitting in the room. If you go to Dakshineshwar, you can see the room where they sat. The temple gate is on the right side. People used to blame him saying that this guy is not teaching anything. He's just joking with them, giving them rasgullas. What is he teaching? Spoiling the youth. Anyway. So they were sitting and talking and they re everybody referred to him as Thakur, Sri Ramakrishna. So Thakur started telling them a story about a peacock who went to a temple and the priest mixed opium in the food. Mm. So the peacock drank it. And then every day at the same time, peacock used to come because of the opium. To take, oh, addiction. <laughs> Good addiction. So, he said that and uh, then he said, ah, the peacock is going to come now. So they thought, what is it? Sometimes he said crazy things, so they just dismissed it. Hello. Which peacock? There were no peacock there. In ten minutes, Mahindranath Gupta entered. And Thakur said in a whisper to Narendra, the peacock has come. <laughs> uh, so then you know what happened afterwards. He became, he could go only on Sunday. So all the description in the gospel of Ramakrishna is what he noted down on Sundays. And then Sri Ramakrishna approved him as the scribe. Because when another disciple of his, Swami Akhandananda, who was the youngest, started imitating him and taking notes, he said, throw it into the Ganga, you are not writing. But he was allowed to write. That is the M who lived a hundred years ago. So anyway, so when you have a form and a name, there's something important because it's not so easy to fix your attention or abstract Vedanta and say, oh Krishna is also the supreme being because he says so in the Gita. I'm saying this because you have a temple here, you come here, you listen. If there was no hall in the temple, how would I speak to you? The so knowledge is distributed. The knowledge centers as well as centers of devotion. This we should note. Now, since I was talking about the Gita, you know the Bhagavad Gita is called a Gitam. Bhagavad Gitam, song of the Lord. It's not prose. It's not prose. At some point I want to make a ballet where the Bhagavad Gita is sung and somebody like this young lady, Smita, will dance. No, I mean it's somebody. It's so beautiful. So it's a song. You don't uh, speak the Gita. It's a song. Now when you say song, you can't express certain things in prose, especially why do people write love poems 
So it's easier to express in poems with music and so on rather than reading dry language. Doing an essay. Poetic license is there. So you will see that exquisite poetry is usually when there is love or affection, there is exquisite poetry. So it's a song. And this song is even more important because things which can't be conveyed to prose can be conveyed through song. Let me explain this to you a little more. First of all, we'll come to this instrument from which this music comes later. But let me explain this to you. All of us, I can't help going to a little bit of weather. All of us think, right? I think we think. The greatest problem is not to think. We all think. And we all think, if you look carefully, in some language. You don't think without a language. Just try. There will be some language which connects your thought. Of course, there is something thought without a language. We can't, we'll discuss that a little later. But normally all thinking is with a, with a language. Even if you say, I'm not thinking with a language, you're thinking with a language. English now. I sometimes think in Malayalam, more Hindi, or some Sanskrit in that matter, for that matter. So, there is a language. Now, there is one thing which does not have a language and therefore have, has no boundaries, and that is music. If you hear the flute, whether it plays outside the temple or in Vrindavan, you don't need a language. You may be belonging to any language speaking area, but you'll listen to it and you'll enjoy it. It doesn't need words. Western music, there is beautiful music like Beethoven, Mozart. You don't need a language, you don't need words, you listen to it. Everybody enjoys it. So therefore language, I'm sorry, music is a link between you, your mind, and that which cannot be measured by language. We can open Ishat says, that which even words cannot describe, but music can describe. Sound can describe. And the greatest music and the most important sound is the sound of the pranava. Which is Om. And that again is a link between you and that which is beyond your limited personality, which is Krishna or God, whatever you want to call it. So, and just look at this carefully. Krishna takes the flute and plays. Okay. We are fascinated. Gopis don't know where they are standing. They're looking up and down. They're not aware of their clothes. And can you make music if the flute was solid? Suppose you take a flute and fill it with muck, mud. Can you play on it? Can you? Play? No. So the instrument for the music to come through, even if he's trying hard to play it, has to be clear of ego and empty and khali. If this happens, if the mind or the flute is emptied of all dross, and all the pretensions and prejudices that have gone into it, greed, anger, everything out, then you have an instrument through which the Lord can play. You have to offer it clean. And from our point of view, which is from the yogic point, I come from the Nath Sampradaya. People have a misunderstanding that Nath Sampradaya believe only in Shiva or something, not like that. We believe that Govinda or the Supreme Being picks up the flute and plays which is our Shushumna Nadi 
when it is absolutely clean and the music comes through the seven holes which are the seven chakras in the system. That's our understanding. You don't have to believe it. You can say it's playing in Vrindavan and listening. But if you're really listening like a gopi then you have no selfishness at all and you enjoy the music. So therefore Having said this much, I'm not going to tell you a little short, small stories. These young men will enjoy stories. But you'll think that I'm grown up, so all these are stories. But please listen to them like stories, okay? Uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes is a novel, don't you enjoy it? Okay. Harry Potter is a novel. <laughs> so, this is, first consider it a story and then see what it means. This is a story about how, you know, Krishna goes off to Dwarka and he's staying with Satyabhama and his other wives. But they do full service to him. Every 15 minutes, every 5 minutes, they're looking after him. And yet, when he sleeps, in his dream, he keeps saying, Gopis, Radha. So Satyabhama is a little bit irritated. What is this? We are looking after him. He's still thinking of those Gopis, the cowherd girls in Vrindavan. What's the matter with this guy? You know, it happens. So, Krishna decides, you know, in this whole drama, Krishna, who is considered to be a Purnavatar, does all kinds of antics, which is nice. Uh, he uh, pretends to have a terrible stomachache. All the Vaityas come and check him up and they say that no cure. <laughs> then Narada comes, you know, where, when Narada comes, you know, you know what happens. Uh, it's a wonderful figure in, in the epics, Narayana, Narayana comes with his veena and pretends to be a great physician also. So he takes his pulse and all that. He asks Krishna, so what to do now? I'm asking you. <laughs> because your disease you know how to cure. I don't know. It's yours. So what do I do? He says, very simple. I already said what to do and nobody is willing to do it. He said, what? I need the dust of somebody's feet and nobody is willing to give it to me. Can you imagine giving the dust of your feet to God or to your husband? You'll go to hell hundred times. So neither Satyabhama nor Rukmini nor anybody is ready to do this. So he says, if you can find some, then I th my stomach ache will go. Otherwise there is no way out. Narada says, all right, let me try. I am traveling all the time. So another Narayana, Narayana, he disappears. He's an aerial traveler, so he goes away. And then he lands in Vrindavan. Soon, this is a beautiful story. I know you'll say it's a story, but listen. Um, he lands in Vrindavan. And uh, the gopis saw him, so they come running to him. They say, hey, Narada, uh, where are you coming from? He says, I'm coming from Dwaraka. I said, Dwaraka? So what is our little fellow doing Krishna there? What's he doing? We are kind of lost and dry here. There is nothing in our hearts now gone. He's gone off, stolen our hearts and run off to the Dwaraka. What's he doing? Then he says, okay, I'll tell you. They said, no, 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 no. We don't want to hear what, what he's doing. He's a terrible fellow. He left us and went off. Narada said, but listen, I want to tell you. He says, okay. What is happening? He said, he has a terrible stomach ache. And so they get very worried, no medicine to cure him. He said, yeah, there is a medicine, nobody would be willing to do that. What is this medicine? Said, you have to take the dust of your feet and put it in his mouth. Gopi said, there is nobody in Dwaraka who can do this. The most important thing is to get rid of his stomach ache. We can't bear him suffering. Here. 
they dust their feet, all the gopis. So one sack full of dust from their feet. Narada takes it on his back and flies back to... He doesn't have to pass immigration. So he flies back into Dwarka. <laughs> and then uh, he empties the sack and says, Here I brought it. So Krishna looks at Rukmini and Satyabhama takes a pinch and puts it in his mouth and says, Ah, that's so sweet. He says, My stomachache is gone. So they say, Who gave this terrible sin of taking dust? Krishna says, The Gopikas. You know what it means? I think I don't care for myself, I only care for the Lord. This what will happen to me? Who cares? Okay. Now we'll come to a little children's story. Okay. Uh, there was a little boy whose mother was very poor. Actually, they didn't know who the father was. She used to work with many. This is the case with Narada also. The mother used to work with various travelers and rishis and somehow the child was born. Nobody knows who's, but the mother knows who, mother and child. So the mother wants to send him to a patshala. There is no patshala close by, it's very far. And to go to the patshala, he has to clear a forest, very thick forest, wild animals. But the mother says, just because I am poor, I am not going to not educate my son. He has to go. So one day she takes him to the forest, meets the teacher, Acharya, and says, he says, okay, I'll take him for free. So uh, he's admitted. Now the problem is, every day he has to cross the forest. So his mother says to him, so he says, Mama, today I have to go to the Teacher, but you are not coming, I am alone. What will happen to me? There are wild animals, I heard them the other day. So the mother says to him, just to make him confident and not be afraid. Actually, she doesn't know, but she just says, you know, in the forest, we tell such stories to kids, right? That's why it's always good to say positive stories to kids. Don't talk to them about ghosts. Poor fellows will be frightened all their lives, even after they grow up. So, he said, um, in the forest, in the deep forest, there's a little boy who lives there, same size as you, a little bit dark. You know the Sanskrit word for dark? Krishnavarna, dark, skinned. And uh, he, he also has some peacock feather on his hair sometimes and he plays a flute, beautiful music. So when you go in and if at all you feel frightened, just close your eyes and say, hey friend, come help me, I'm frightened and he'll come. So the boy says, okay, well, does he have a name? This is supposed to be set in Kerala. So the mother says to him, he's called Umni. Means a little boy. So this guy goes through the forest and then he hears the animals. You get frightened. So he shouts, hey Umni, Oriva, come quickly because I'm very frightened. And so actually a small boy comes with and a flute in his hand. And he says, sit down, sit down. I'm here, your mother told me and told you, right? Ah, I'm this guy. Okay, let's sit down. He plays the flute beautifully. He's fully absorbed and he says, hey, it's time for you to go now, sitting here. Ah, so he walks up to the edge of the forest, leaves him there and goes back. This is happening every day. Every day the boy comes back and reports to his mother. Oh, today he played the flute. Oh, today we played marbles. Oh, today the mother is laughing to herself. I told him a story, he fully believes me. Yeah. 
poor fellow. Anyway, good. At least he's going to school. So one day, there is a, the birthday of the Acharya, the teacher. So everybody goes with different gifts. They are supposed to go. There is nothing to take. This boy doesn't have, his mother doesn't have anything. So she gives him a small silver katuri and a little bit of milk and says, take it, but please remember this is the only katuri I have in my house. You give the milk and bring back the katuri. So I said, okay. So he goes. Again there are wild animals making noises, so the boy comes. He says, what is this? He says, the birthday of my teacher, so I'm taking some milk in the category. Ah, he says, can I taste it? He says, no, 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 it's a gift. He says, oh, come on, give it. Playfully, he takes it from him. And he says, beautiful milk, great milk. Take it anyway and give it to me. So, they cross the forest. And then he leaves him and comes away. Boy goes there, big line of people giving big, big gifts and presents. There's only this little katori, and that also he has to get the katori back. So all his students, co-students, are making fun of him. Uh, oh, he wants the katori back, wow. So the master says, okay, doesn't matter, go get a bucket from there. So they bring a bucket. Okay, you will say it's a story, fine. He pours the milk into it and says, take your katori. Boy says, but there is some milk here still. Oh, okay, pour it. Goes on till the whole bucket is full and there is still milk in the katori. So the teacher gets very suspicious. The Acharya says, what is this? Do you know magic? Does your mother know Indrajal or something? He says, no, I don't know anything. I just, no, no, but something has happened. Can you tell us what? From the time you brought it till here, something must have happened. He said, nothing very significant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One, my friend, a little fellow who lives in the forest, the dark guy, he tried to sip this milk. That I know. Teacher gets very angry. Why did you allow And then you're giving it to me. He said, but I don't know. He just snatched it from me. And, and I think something he did because I don't know why this milk is not stopping. So the teacher laughs and says, this fellow is a liar. He is just lying. There's something is wrong here. There is no such boy there in the forest. There is nothing. He is just lying. He says, okay, can you take me there? We said, sure, innocently, I will take you there. So he brings the teacher to the forest with all the disciples following. They go there and he shouts, hey, Uni, come, come. My teacher has come to see you. Come. No sound. Total silence. No boy, no Krishna, no nothing, no flute. He gets very desperate. He said, they're calling, they're calling me a liar, please come. Then there is a voice that comes from the sky. Akashavani says, these fellows are not ready to see me. You are ready to see me. You are so innocent, so clear of mind. So you saw me. These fellows, they can't see me. They, they'll see me when they become clear. And they go home. And you'll say this, the first one is a story, the second one is a story. Bhagavatam, have you read the Bhagavatam? It's full of stories. And the great truths of Vedanta are revealed in simple stories. Because storytelling and listening to stories affects the mind more than talking rubbish all the time. <laughs> okay. Having said this, <clears throat> I want to tell you another story. Now, this story is, uh, all this is because of Janmashtam. Now, this story is a little serious and the character here who does this, please don't imitate, imitate her because it's not possible for most people to do it. We should know our limits, where we stand. It's better to tell Krishna, oh, give me this, give me that, instead of saying, I don't want anything. Because if the rug is pulled under the feet, then we'll get desperate. So, 
the Kurukshetra war is over. Krishna is going back to Dwaraka. <clears throat> he has to say goodbye to everybody. He is a decent man. So people of his own age, he goes and hugs. People who are elder to him, he does pranams. It's even difficult for ordinary people like us to do pranams. Huh? Krishna doing pranams, can you believe this? So to the elders he does pranams. And then he's going. So the who's the patriarch of the family? The most senior lady in the family. Kunti Devi. She goes to Kunti Devi to do pranams. So then he says to Kunti, look. I am going to Dwarka. <coughs> this is the right time. If you need any boon from me, any blessing from me, it is the right time to ask because I will go away to Dwarka now. You won't find me. So if you have anything in mind, please ask me now. I promise to fulfill your wishes. Kunti Devi, it is a very interesting dialogue. Kunti says to Krishna, can you stop this drama for a second, please? I know you so well. <laughs> you are saying I am going to Dwarka, you go nowhere. You are here, there, everywhere. You are saying I am going to Dwarka. You started the war in a way. Then you joined our side and we won. And now you are saying, I don't know anything, you people fought. And now you are saying, I am going to Dwaraka, you are going nowhere, I know you, so please stop this drama. And you said, I know who you are. And you said, ask for a boon and I will give it to you. Okay, I am going to ask you for a boon, you have to give it, you promised. He said, yeah, okay, this is the boon. Bring all the sorrows of the world on my head, this is the boon. How many people can? Don't do it also. It's not impossible unless one is what is soaked in what is called parabhakti, it's not possible. Because we are always asking for good things, for pleasure. Here says Kunti, bring all the sorrows of the world on my head. Even Krishna is taken aback. What is this kind of boon? She says, because it's only when there is sorrow that people usually think of God. <laughs> Guru Granth Sahib of the six. Dukhme smirana sab kare sukhma kare na koi. You might light a lamp, that's okay. But really earning call from the heart is when one is in trouble. So if the sorrows of the world keep coming on me, I'll keep calling you. I have a guarantee that if I call, you will appear. This I have no doubt. What more do I need? I will be constantly seeing you. Why? Because sorrow will come. I will call you, you will come. Again a sorrow, again I will call you. What more do I need? To see you means to be free of all sorrow. This is exactly what I want. Can you give it to me? Krishna says, Tathastu, so be it. This is the highest level of devotion. But the only thing you want is the Lord and nothing else. If this becomes the height of devotion, it's not different from Vedanta. Where all that the yogi aspirant desires is the supreme reality, nothing else. Everything else is illusion for him. There's not much difference except in the approach. And the most important thing is that instrument from which the music of the Lord come should be emptied and cleared, mostly of the ego that we carry. So, now I am going to tell you another story. This is the last, okay? <laughs> uh, after this we will stop and if you need to have a discussion about something, we can do it. Um, <coughs> Apparently, 
And there was a guy who was a great sculptor. You know what a sculptor? One who makes sculptures, great expert. This was told to me by an elderly head of a Lingayas Mutt in Karnataka, Shivacharya Swami. Um, so this guy um, went to a temple. He was summoned by the priest to make a deity. So he went there. The priest told him, I think according to some calculations, in three months you are going to die. So this guy said, what is this? You are saying three months I am going to die. You have to find the solution. You are the priest. You are the direct link to God. So what is this? Uh, he said, yeah, there is a solution. Very practical solution. He said, what is that? He said, you still have three months, right? Go back. Make three more images which look exactly like you. You're such a good sculpture. Make three images which are your size, exactly like you. You go and stand in the middle somewhere. Now, you know the mythology, the epics say that Yamadeva sends his uh, dutas to get the soul when the time comes. So, he said, the priest said, these dutas of Yama, they come on a buffalo, they're a little bit weak-minded. So, if you stand in the middle of all these three more which you have made, duplicates, they cannot figure out which is original and which is duplicate. They are stupid fellows. So they will wait for some time and then the muhurta will pass and then they will go away. So do that. He said, okay. So he made three images of himself and went and stood in the middle and the Yamadutas came Interesting for children, if I describe the uh, Yamadutas, what we leave it there. So, I came and they wanted to take his soul. They looked around, there were four. They couldn't make out which is original, it's so beautiful. So, they looked around, Murta passed, they went back, saved. They went to Yamadeva and said, Boss, and they didn't say, Boss, I'm saying. Uh, what to do? This guy is so clever. He made images and stood in the middle and we couldn't find out who is who. So he came back. Yamadeva said, I always knew you fellows are idiots, but it doesn't matter. Next time, in another three months, he's same thing is going to happen. He's going to die. But they said, but then he'll do the same thing and we can't make out. He said, before going, I'll whisper a mantra in your ears. Okay? Then you go. Then you'll find him. He said, okay. Three months passed. The priest said, again, your time is coming. He did the same thing. He went and stood. He didn't have to make because already done. Yamadutas were going to pick him up. They asked the boss, now what? Boss whispered something into their ears. Ah, okay. So they came. You know what they did? They simply came, stood in front and started praising the statues which were there. He said, it looks so real, can't make out which is duplicate and which is original. The skin looks so much like skin. The hair is human hair, really. And when I keep my hand on, when we keep our hand under the nose, it is as if it is breathing. What a wonderful thing. About two, three minutes he kept quiet. Then he couldn't control himself. He said, oh, I made it, you know. <laughs> and then they said, come. Let's go, your time is up. <laughs> so that is the biggest problem. If that is taken out, <laughs> then you can get the beautiful music of the Gitam coming through the flute so that you enjoy every second of your life. It's not as if it comes and goes. Om Shanti Shanti. I should have said, oh, Ananda, Ananda, Lord. So, that's it. I think it's enough. We got all the things. If you need to ask me something,
Don't ask me how, oh, where to get the flute. What do you... <laughs> then uh, we can discuss. Mr. Subbariti. Uh, According to Sankaracharya, uh, Advaitam, uh, there is only one thing, but he introduced the concept of Maya. And Maya being screened between the ultimate and the people. Once you remove that Maya, then we become one with the God. And my question is, first, why the Maya is created by God? And then by doing certain difficult things, spiritual things, we yep. remove that. Once you remove that, all the realized souls become one uh, in, at the same level of their gradations among the liberated souls. And once they reach that stage, they will become individual, still retain the individuality, or they become one. No, we already have many questions. <laughs> <laughs> Sense, but uh, I don't want to take all your time. <laughs> so, okay, thanks. Now, what is the crucial uh, part of Shankaracharya's statement? It's not only Shankaracharya, I mean his interpretation of the Upanishads and so on. Of course, he said, Brahma Satyam Jagat Mitya. He said, pause. But as long as you eat and drink and have your emotions, you cannot say you are Brahman. You are still in Maya. While you are in Maya, Maya is a reality. When you are outside it, then it is Maya. Right? Now, um, you can say simply, this is all Maya, but it doesn't work. I will say it is all Maya. If somebody calls me a fool, then I get angry. So where is the Maya? It's not there. So, while it is a high statement, it's not easy to grasp this except through sadhana, to finding out. Not by simply chanting, I am Brahman, I am, nobody becomes Brahman. It includes, it only builds up on the ego and one thing, so I am Brahman. It's better to say I am a human being. One thing. Second thing is, you are asking me why that Maya came. Buddha said this in a very beautiful way. He said, if you go into a garden and somebody shoots an arrow at you. What is the first, you are suffering, there is pain, right? Sorrow, pain. What is the first thing you should do? Remove the arrow and get rid of the pain or lie there with the arrow in your chest and figure out how did it come, where did it come from? You will probably die of gangrene before you find the solution. So the first step is to move out of the sorrow and how to move out of the sorrow is only when you figure out that desire is the root cause of all sorrow. If, wait, wait, not finished. And, <laughs> and if you move out of the sorrow and figure out the essence, then you will probably be able to know the answer why this maya has come and why we are trying to come out of it. And this question is very similar to a child asking the father and mother, do you love me very much? Yes, we love you very much. Then if you love me so much, why didn't you invite me for your wedding? <laughs> you understand what I am trying to say? We are so small and puny that we probably cannot find out why it happened, but it's a fact that it has happened. So can we deal with it as it is? And then maybe when you find out, you'll know why. Unfortunately, most people who have found out have not been able to express why. Okay, point one. Second, the same Shankaracharya who said Brahma Satyam Jagat Mitya, wrote all the commentaries on the Upanishads and the Brahma Sutras, which are so tough to read. Achato Brahma Gignasa. This is how it begins. 
द सेम शंकरा सेड भज गोविंदम भज गोविंदम गोविंदम भज मूडम थे यू फूल नॉट यू सॉरी फूल चैन द नेम ऑफ गोविंदा संप्राप्ते सन्निहिते काले योर डेथ इज अप्रोचिंग नहीं नहीं रक्षति दुख ऋण करने ऑल दिस ग्रामेटिकल कंस्ट्रक्शन आर नॉट गोइंग टू हेल्प चैन द नेम ऑफ गोविंदा दिस ऑल्सो वी शुड कीप इन माइंड एंड इट इज द सेम शंकराचार्य हु रोट द वेदांतिक डिस्कशन एंड ओपनिषतिक इंटरप्रिटेशन एंड सेट ब्रह्म सत्यम जगत मिथ्या एंड सो ऑन is also the same shankaracharya apart from baja govindam who wrote this beautiful celebration known as the saundari lahri where he said bhavani tvam dase mahi vitara drishtim sakaruna same shankaracharya so if you are following shankara then you should follow the whole thing you can't only dis- divide it and follow only one if you follow one also it is okay but you must admit that the other fellow might be following the other side then we are okay i think so sir he had some he was immediately taking the mic even before mr reddy finished <laughs> um thank you so much for for What's you what's your name uh, badri khanal i am from badrinath. nepal badrinath mm. so thank you for your presence And where are you from badrinath ah uh, nepal 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 mm. so uh, my question is a little bit of uh, related to technology technology and okay. then your your physical presence right in front of us i'm just trying to uh, compare your physical presence here with so many um, like uh, online resources like youtube i i call myself a little bit of a spiritual seeker i'm trying to seek the vedantic knowledge and all those stuffs but unlike in the past where we had uh, like some scar of like gurukul and you know we used to go to people used to go to in front of the gurus and spend years and years seeking the direct knowledge interventions for vision from the guru so we are very uh, unfortunate that we have to be happy with whatever we have from youtubes and googles and YouTube and youtube so i'm just trying because uh, in the last an hour or so i was so impressed with uh, your teachings is not only because the content of the teaching but your presence itself was so so powerful i had some i felt that way right so is it the presence of the guru or the swamis that is important or the knowledge of youtubes <laughs> because i am in dilemma because there are so many youtube I discourses know, I, and I, videos I, 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 and that I, I, is the only thing that i am left with and i can't stop listening to those resources because i am so addicted because that is how i want to spend my days in you know hours so please uh, tell me what is my choice because i can't what fly your, what's your what what is my choice what are my options now because i can't choice, choice. choice. right so i don't have any i don't know any gurus any swamis i can't fly to india to meet you and you know get your teachings so thank you so uh, let me tell you this you're right there are so many things on youtube um problem is i think it's better to not have any guru than to have a wrong guru because then it will take many years for you to come out and then start fresh again so my suggestion is my suggestion personal is you said that you feel something in my presence that that's okay um, my suggestion is that if your search for the truth which i think you are very sincere i'm not denying that is very serious then the right kind of guidance i think will come to you in some way you have to be sincere don't fall into traps especially avoid teachings which have to be paid for hmm and don't judge a teacher by his appearance you say i appear nice or i may be but i may be a fraud we don't know 
So, go through all the teachings, all the books, and then think carefully before you decide. And then, while personal understanding and guidance is important, I agree with you, it is also important that I, my aspiration for spiritual progress should be deep. Okay. Having said that, I must also say that if you are seeking a spiritual teacher, you should get rid of the conventional ideas that we have. Because that prejudice may prevent us from seeing a real teacher sometimes. Sometimes. I'm going to tell you a story. Sorry, I, we need to stop at 12, but this is a short story. I'll finish fast. Um, there was a rich man in the Middle East. Hmm? And uh, when he was very young, he had great spiritual aspirations. But he was very poor. And being very poor, he also had the desire to become rich. So somewhere along the line, his spiritual aspirations got neglected and he became a rich man. And he grew up. Depends on what you want, right? And he became a big man. When he reached the age of 50 or 55, he said to himself, I thought I would be happy because by becoming rich. But money doesn't seem to be buying happiness for me. There is something more. Perhaps this little flame of spiritual interest which is in me, it's still there like a spark. Maybe I should ignite it and move towards it. So he decided to distribute all his things to his sons and daughters. And uh, took a little money to build a small hut in the oasis. In those countries, water is there only in the oasis, not like us. We have plenty of water in the oasis. And there he started to live alone and meditate, giving up. But then he uh, also carried all the books he had collected on the subject, he made a library inside. Having been a rich man for many years, he had so many servants, he had even forgotten how to make a cup of tea. He has to live alone, so he went to the village. After searching, he found a cook. So he took the cook and he went. So the cook would cook for him and he would study and he would meditate. Seven years passed. At the end of seven years, it occurred to him that this which I am seeking requires a teacher. Unexplored territory is not easy. I might stumble and fall. So he went out, start searching for a teacher. He went to many caves and hermits. Not satisfied. Don't know what he was looking for. Not satisfied. Then he saw a very vulnerable looking man coming with a green turban. It could be green or it could be saffron. Doesn't matter. Turban. <laughs> and uh, rosaries on the neck and a big beard so big that you could tuck it into the collar vulnerable looking guy so he went to him with folded hands and said sir you seem to be a great uh, yogi can you become my guru the guy said how do you know that I am a great yogi Huh? He said, I don't know, I think you are a great you. You look like that. I said, okay. Looks are deceptive, but let me tell you something. You are a very sincere fellow, I think. I would be, uh, I would be happy to take you on as a disciple. But there is a big problem. I don't do anything without taking permission from my teacher, my guru. And he has disappeared somewhere. I can't find him. Seven years I didn't, I've been searching for him. I couldn't find him. If I find him, then I will ask him and then I will take you as my disciple. So this guy said, so are you searching alone? He said, ah, I'm searching alone. He said, I can also help you if you give me a description. So please describe, because I can help you. 
So he said, well, he's a short man. His upper body is always bare. He wears only a loincloth. He has a towel on his right shoulder all the time. But he's a very good cook. So this fellow said, oh God, this looks like a description of my cook. So he said, can you come with me to my cottage? He said, yeah, okay. So he took him there. As they entered, the kitchen door opened and the cook came out with a towel on his shoulder. Immediately, this great man prostrated before him and said, Oh, Master, where have you been? Seven years, I'm looking for you. Where have you been? He said, I was with this fellow. He said, but he's still looking for a guru. He said, it took me seven years to get it into his head that he needs a teacher. Okay? Now that he has found you, you please help him because I have other work to do and walked out of the place. You know what I mean? So there are no such criteria. You don't know how they are, <laughs> where they come from. And somewhere deep down I have a feeling that somebody in Nepal is waiting for you. I'll shake your hands, but Something will come from Nepal, I think. With the blessings of Pashupati Nath. Huh? Let's see. My oh, blessings. Huh? This is the last question because we need to go. Uh, thank you. He asked me yesterday also. He said, I'll ask you tomorrow. <laughs> and I have another question for yesterday, but I'm not going to ask that. Okay. Uh, today happens to be Krishna Ashtami, Krishna Janmashtami, and there's a lot of puja is going on all yes. over. Yes. Now, I've been asked many times, is puja really necessary? It's too totally religious. I am uh, not religious, I am spiritual, so I don't need to do all those kinds of... Uh, Papuitra, Pavitra and all that. Is that really essential? That's my question. The question is very simple. I am a spiritually minded person. Is it necessary for me to do the ritual of actual puja? This is the question, precisely. If you really think you are spiritual, and you see the presence of the Divine everywhere, you probably don't have to do any puja. However, how many people are there like that? We can only count them in the fingers of our hand, perhaps even not. So, for most people, it's good to be engaged in doing, see, doing puja, doing seva, doing, you see, what happens is, like I said before, we are human beings who live through our senses. So, if you don't let the senses enjoy things like worship, they will try to enjoy something else. This is better than that. Okay. The other is, it also has a certain um, rhythm generated for the mind, which is usually rhythmless. So, it, it gets into a certain movement, which brings the mind together into the deity that you worship. If you say, I can see the deity in my heart, there is no need. But people can't. It's not so easy to do that. Okay. The other thing is, when you do puja, you also chant mantras. Right? Now, the mantras have a built-in vibration, even if you don't know the meaning. Sanskrit is such a language, that it has a built-in rhythm to it, so that when you chant it, the mind and the breath both. You see, you can't chant without breathing. The mind and the breath both get into a certain uh, of rhythm, order. In fact, one of the mantras is Rhythm Vadesha. So, and the mantras are not chanted haphazard. When you do puja, I say, Panditji is here, he was here now. Ask him, there are some <coughs> rhythms which are built into the mantras. So if you chant it accordingly, even if you don't know the meaning, 
they will make your mind's waves come to a certain way so that they can go inside. For instance, there are many mantras, Purnamada, Purnamidam, there is Asato, Masat, Gamaya, which, which is not even a prayer. It simply means, may I go from the unreal to the real. It's not even a prayer. It's an affirmation. Then there are those beautiful mantras from the Aitriya, Taitriya. When you chant it, even if you simply chant out, there is the Gayatri mantra. There is Sahana Avavatu. See, when you chant a mantra, apart from the meaning of the mantra, there is a notation to it. If somebody chants, ah, suppose I am chanting Shanti mantra, but the pujari who does it will chant it properly. So you learn how to chant it, and then the pranayam, the mind, everything works in unison. And then after you have reached that stage, you can be free of it. But it's good to, you know, like if I chant, Shanno Mitra Shammarunaha Shanno Bhavattari Yama Shanna Hindro Brihaspati Shanno Vishnu Rurukrama Namo Brahmane Namaste Vayutva Meva Pratyacham Brahmasi Tva Meva Pratyacham Brahma Vadishami Ridham Vadishami Satyam Vadishami Tanmama Vatu Tadvaktara Mavatu Avatumam, Avatu Vaktaram, Om Shanti. You may not know the meaning. You may, somebody may not. But the rhythm of this mantra, the sound, the rhythm Vadishyami works into your system. And there is something coming out of that. So this is the reason why all this has been prescribed. Well, Having said that, I must also say that while you do puja, it's important that the mind has to be clean and clear. There's no question about that. Even when you build a temple and install an image, there is a process called the prana pradishta, right? Uh, otherwise, it's just in a uh, stone idol. Uh, when the sculptor makes it, he probably sits on the head and takes the eye out with his chip with his hammer. But then once it's made and it is put up there, still it's not become holy. Then prana pradishta is done. Who does the prana pradishta? A qualified person who knows what to do. What does he do? Put in a nutshell, he clears his heart, does avahana, invites that particular deity into his heart, fills it with energy, prana, and then invites him to go into that image and then it becomes fit for worship, prana pradishta is over. So I usually ask who is important, that or the person who does prana pradishta. So if you can see that as antaryami all the time, then you probably don't have to, but how many people are there? So it's better to, that's my discussion on this matter. It's not a, a what you call a final answer. Thank you very much.